Our next technical session for the morning will be mobile devices and the common issues that occur. This is technical session number 30. Uh, we should, throughout the course of this technical session, be able to identify common issues that users experience with mobile devices. Oh, I just jumped right through that, didn't I? And describe how likely, <laughs> how to likely resolve the common issues. So let me go ahead and drop that link. My apologies. I just stingy, Kelly. I'm like right, to the right on that. Sharing is caring. All right. So here we go. Link is dropped in the chat. Go ahead and you know put it in there a few extra times just because I withheld it from you earlier. And the behavior, skills, and mindsets we want to keep in mind with regards to this type of session is persistence and adaptability. Oftentimes, persistence is forgotten. We have to be relentless in our pursuit of answers and solutions. You know, we got to be detectives when we're trying to solve problems for customers because they're not always going to be extremely obvious. And the more difficult ones, these are going to allow you to gain more skills, be it in networking, be it in cloud service, be it in security. So as you're able to solve these, you develop your skills in these other areas. And if it is above what you are capable of handling at that time and you have to hand it off, take that initiative. Talk to the next tier above you and say, hey, you know, this, this project that we were working on, what was the solution to it? How did you end up fixing it if it's not in the notes? That way, when you see that problem again, you'll know how to fix it. Also, it keys in to the upper group. Hey, this person is interested in developing. This person wants to grow. This person wants to be a greater asset. So it lets them know that you are eager to develop as a team member. And so when one of those positions opens up, they may go, you know what? Melinda's always up here asking after tickets that she's been working on what the correct solution was. So she's trying to develop. She's gotten a lot better over the last six months. I think she'd be a really good asset to this team. So then they'll bring you up to tier two. So persistence. Also, you got to be your own cheerleader. Don't sit back and wait for somebody to do it for you. Doesn't mean you have to be arrogant and just run through the halls screaming, I'm the best IT person ever. You know, you don't have to go through doing this kind of stuff. But, you know, when it comes time for review, a lot of times they, you have notes that you can make. Okay, well, I handled X amount of tickets. I tend to go for the most difficult, you know, and you start rattling off your achievements. All right. So common issues that you may come across with mobile devices. Not all mobile devices issues <clears throat> are unique to a specific device. They may encounter the same issues as desktop computers. So here is a non-exhaustive list of things we may experience. Display, sticking keys. Here goes somebody ate food while they were playing with their mobile device. Uh, ghost cursors no power, freezing, overheating, various stuff like that. We're going to kind of dive into each one of these as we move along. <clears throat> First, display issues. Most displays up until very recently where OLEDs are starting to become most popular, they would have backlighting issues or power problems for the LCD screen. And it is powered through the inverter because Older mobile devices will still utilize the CCFL and the inverter in the device in order to light it. Newer ones have that LED and the LED backlight, and it's not so much an issue. So if there's no display on an older device, you check the inverter first before checking the backlighting itself, since the inverter is the cheapest to replace. Now, when we're talking about mobile devices, we're not necessarily just talking phones. It could be tablets. Um, in this instance, it may also be a laptop. All right. After that, dim displays can be going, you know, 
also could revert to the inverter itself. It also could be a backlight itself is dying. If it's an older one still using the CCFL bulbs, if, one, if it uses four bulbs to light it up, one or two of those bulbs come out, you now have a much slower or a much dimmer display, not able to uh, reach the brightness it once did. <clears throat> the other thing is, is so that person may have actually turned down the brightness. This happens quite often. Like if they were using the phone at night and the brightness of the screen is really hurting their eyes, they'll go in, they'll turn that brightness down because they wanted to answer that really, really important text message at 3 a.m. And then the next morning when they wake up, they forget all about that. And the screen is really dark. They can't read anything. They can't see anything. And they forgot that they've dimmed the screen. So as an IT tech, before you start breaking these things open, let's check the settings first, make sure that the settings haven't been adjusted. Um, on laptops, there's the FN key. And then there's the uh, little icon of a, uh, you know, a bigger and a smaller sun. And that would be how you would turn the brightness up or down on a laptop utilizing the function keys or the FN keys. Um, yes, great point, Mark. Always look for the easy and easiest and least invasive solutions first. We don't want to start with the nuclear option. We want to start with the easy, simple solutions and then build into the nuclear option. Uh, we often refer to what is called the King method, um, which was every time there was a problem, it was instantly reset everything to factory settings. And uh, that was my old partner, Marvin. His last name was King. He worked at Circuit City and that was their, their MO. So anytime a computer came in with a problem, Circuit City was like, yeah, well, we're gonna, we can fix it for you. And they go ahead and they just reset everything to factory settings. That, that was basically what they did. And uh, it was like, was it like, $49.99 or something like that to do the reset or something like that. So early on, we, we jokingly started calling it the King method. Uh, and that is resetting everything to factory settings. So that essentially is the nuclear option with regards to um, computer repair. That is not the first thing you want to do. It's something that you would do a little bit further down the, lo the, the road. If you're dealing with, uh, back to the display issues, if you're dealing with a laptop, there's a little button when you close it that instantly tells the laptop to turn that um, the screen off. If that button is obstructed, you know, like debris has gotten in there or something like that, it may go ahead and keep the monitor off because in its, based on its sensors, it's, it's thinking that the laptop is closed. So the monitor should be off. So, oh, there are many reasons. Karen, while, while Circuit City is out of business. Some of the worst customer service experiences I've ever had in my life had to do with Circuit City. And expensive too. They were oh, yeah. outrageously expensive. <laughs> oh yeah. And I remember having an argument with them. I was like, because I bought the extended warranty and then they said they didn't have my warranty on file. And I was like, well, here it is. And they're like, well, we don't have our copy. And I'm like, well, where's your, where's your copies? Like, well, we keep them in a storage unit. And I'm like, so get, let me get this straight. You are a computer company that stores all of your warranty data on paper in a, in a, in a storage unit. Yes. Them and Radio Shack, I don't see how they lasted as long as they did. <clears throat> well, Radio Shack was its adapters and connectors. They had like one of the, like for people who were into like CB radios and who built electronics outside of computers, like they were like one of the only places you could find a lot of these like hard to find components. So they were really good for stuff like that. That's how they stuck around. Circuit City, no clue. They got bought up by, was it Tiger Direct or something like that? <clears throat> and that's kind of how they got uh, fresh income and were able to stick around. All right. Flickering on displays. What do we know it is not if it's flickering? Obvious, come on, you got it. Just say it. What doesn't flicker? Uh, LED, like LCD, LED. LEDs do not flicker. Um, now, if you have flickering issues, <clears throat> you check the cables connectors. That's one of your quick, easy ones. 
that might be the only way where it would appear like an LED is flickering is because the power is quickly being turned off and on. But the LED itself failing will not flicker. They're either on or off. Um, it also could be a driver issue that can be resolved by updating the graphics card. And the other issue might be the screen refresh rate is just too low. Could be somebody updated it because it, it worked better with a certain application, didn't change it back when they were done. So you can increase it and set it back to its native resolution and refresh. And that will likely clean that issue up. All right, next, cannot display to an external monitor. Even though the hardware is connected, you've checked your cables. Always remember cables have two sides. So check the one at your computer, check the one at the monitor. Don't just check the one. <clears throat> so it's all connected. Does not necessarily mean it will be compatible. That's one. So first you wanna check the compatibility. You can check the documentation of the two devices, make sure they work together. If you're dealing with analog signals, it's usually pretty straightforward. They, you know, if they can receive the DB15, they're typically compatible because of the analog signal. Um, so that would be your first thing, just verify compatibility. If it's not the issue, there are a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, there is a key combination on laptops that will enable external display. It will allow you to either be just on the laptop, on the screen, or both. This is a really good one for troubleshooting. Um, it's like the FN key, and then there's a little box at the top that looks almost like a monitor, and that will allow you to toggle between them. So this troubleshoots two different problems here. One being if someone is trying to do a display for a meeting or something like that, and they're unable to, you can quickly do that and get them set up. The other is if they went to a meeting and then they came back and they're unable to get their monitor to work after they've done a presentation, they probably forgot to toggle it back to the laptop. They just thought once you disconnected, everything went back the way it was supposed to. Not necessarily, you still have to function and toggle that um, the display back to the built-in monitor on the laptop. So on uh, some Windows machine, it's the window button and the P key. Otherwise, it's that FN key and then look up near on your numbers or your function keys for one that looks like a little box for a monitor. This is for laptops for the case of this particular um, presentation. Laptops are lumped in with this. Well, it's the yes and no mark. There are cases where they, they, they count laptops as mobile devices and some cases where they don't. In this particular case, they have lumped them in. Yeah, it depends on the day and which way the sun is shining. Yeah, it's frustrating. But usually the way the question is framed, it'll tell you if they're including laptops in it. So they, they try to push you in that direction. All right, sticking keys. Don't eat Cheetos at your desk. Um, typically, with regards to sticking keys, it's usually a collection of dust, dirt, and debris, including spilled liquids like sodas and things like that, um, spilled on there that eventually cause it to stick and the key not to function properly. You can try to clean the keyboard. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the type of keyboard, if you're able to you know, uh, pop off some of the keys or not. Some don't allow that, some do. Some cases you may have multiple keys affected, in which case you are left with two options. The first option is replace the keyboard. Now on a laptop, I'm gonna tell you this is zero fun. Most laptops do not allow you just to unscrew the top of the keyboard, pull the keyboard out and put a new one in. You have to go in through the backside, which means you quite literally have to take out every single component in the laptop to get to the keyboard. Whole lot of work, 
very, very time consuming, extremely easy to break things. So that is one option if you want to go that route. Hopefully it's still under warranty and it becomes somebody else's problem at that point. You can kind of mail it off and let them take care of it. Um, the other thing is, especially for short-term repair, like so that the person can get back to work that day while you're trying to figure things out or, or you know, do a data transfer to another machine, you can plug in an external keyboard to the laptop so that they can continue working. So that is a quick workaround. It gets them back up and running very quickly. It's not a full solution, but it, it takes care of it in the moment so that they can still be productive. All right. Here we go. Next. Intermittent or no wireless. Now, intermittent essentially means sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And typically when you're talking with wireless, that is a result of interference caused by other signals or you're too far from the source location. So it could be interference by devices in between you and the, uh, and the Wi-Fi antenna. It could be other devices turning on at the same time. It could be a, too many devices trying to hook up at the same time and talk at the same time. Because contrary to popular belief, only one wireless device can speak at a time on an antenna. They can't all talk at the same time. Quite literally, only one can talk. And then the others are waiting and then talking, which is why you put too many on there. You start to see slow down pretty quickly. So in this instance, one, make sure you don't have too many devices connected. Two, you might need to relocate an antenna. If this is in an office situation, one of the worst scenarios is if you have somebody the Wi-Fi antenna is on the other side of the lunchroom because it seems like every day at lunch, their internet goes out. And what's happening is, is everybody's going to the lunchroom and turning the microwave on. Microwave operates on the 2.4 gigahertz band. It's blocking out your Wi-Fi. If you're in your house and your kitchen is in the middle of your house, your Wi-Fi is on like in the living room on one side of it and your bedroom is on the other side. If somebody goes in the kitchen, turns the microwave on, it can disrupt your, your Wi-Fi. You may have experienced this and not necessarily put that connection together. If you have a cordless phone in your house, for those of you who still have a telephone wired in your house, it's, it's very rare these days, but you know there, there are some people out there who still do it. We have one here, but a cordless phone operates off of the 2.4 gigahertz. That can also disrupt your Wi-Fi. So placement is important, but also you have a mobile device. So try moving a little bit closer sometimes. Maybe, maybe there's a desk three spots away that is much closer to the antenna that will give you a much better signal. All right. Let's see here. Yes, Karen. Sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Now, now, are you saying the antenna or the uh, or is the antenna in the router? Because we we experience that sometimes where the um because we stream you know the, mm -hmm. the TV shows through the smart TV, yeah. And and sometimes it'll just the the show the the channel the show will just blank out. So is that because of the the because I always just reset the router. I mean, I don't know if I'm doing it, doing that correctly, but well, that, that's usually the first go to. And OK, and when we start talking about networking equipment, you'll understand that like that when we're talking about our home device. When we use the term router, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's actually a multitude of devices in one. So okay. the one at your house, it's a router, it's a WAP, it's a switch, it's, a, you know, it's a whole bunch of stuff in one. Okay. Um, okay. So the actual term router means something very, very specific. Um, but when you're talking about the disruption, likely it's coming from the antenna not being able, or something is in between you and the antenna and it's causing a disruption in the signal. Um, the more walls you have between 
your router and your whatever device you're using causes uh, absorption. So there's like, there's a multitude of things you have to think about with regards to wireless signals. There's reflection, refraction, and absorption of signal. So reflection being it bounces off of it. Refraction means some of it bounces off, some of it goes through. And then you have absorption where it kind of like, you know, essentially takes in some of that signal and doesn't let it pass through. When you're dealing with things like the brick behind you that has a, a higher absorption rate than say drywall. Uh, if you have metal oh. studs in the wall, metal studs in the wall will absorb a signal. You know, if you go into big concrete buildings, uh, mm -hmm. your cell signal doesn't work as good. Like if you go into a right. school or something like that, it's all that concrete and steel around you disrupts that signal. Um, okay. So all of this stuff plays a factor in it. Okay. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. There we go. Fiber is best, but not available everywhere. So I was told by AT and T that fiber would be installed within three months. If if uh, I you know would I be interested in it? I said I absolutely would be interested in it, and that was in 2014. Still waiting. All right. Now, so yeah, move closer to it, try to figure out, you know, if it's something like a microwave or something like that, um, that can disrupt the signal, unfortunately. So you check your wireless antenna. Um, those, you have one in the laptop lid and you have one that is transmitting the signal in the uh, router, essentially in your home or the WAPs in the office. Um, if it's not wireless or if you have no wireless at all, one or two things is happening. Either the wireless has been disabled in the device or the antenna is not functioning itself. So first check to see if, the, the you know, on, on older laptops, they actually have a Wi-Fi button that you can toggle on and off, make sure that is turned on so that you can see it. Also, you can go and check, you know, if you're in Windows, you can check your internet settings just to make sure the Wi-Fi antenna is turned on. Uh, like for my desktop, I have it turned off because a wired, wired signal is much better um, for me. If all of that is on and it's still not working, you may have a bad antenna, in which case it's time to break out the screwdrivers and the pry bars, get into the computer and replace your antenna. <laughs> Questions so far? All right, the ghost cursor or printer drift. So ghost cursor can come from seeing double cursors, can be caused by a faulty trackpad that may be overheated, in which case you can actually go in and turn that trackpad off. Um, set the laptop to hibernate or sleep when the lid closes, and this may help prevent this in the future because you don't have the monitor and the computer kind of sandwiching that touchpad, heating it up, causing it to overheat and not be able to read properly. Um, other things you can do is update the drivers on the, track, the trackpad. And if either of those solutions don't work, disable the trackpad altogether and use an external mouse as a last resort. Pointer drift. Some of you may have experienced this, especially if you have the little uh, pointer stick in the middle of your keyboard over time, you notice that cursor just slowly moving off to the side, uh, even when you're not touching it. Um, you can go change the settings um, in the properties just to kind of update the sensitivity of it. So it is not necessarily uh, drifting at that point. Um, otherwise, it could be a user issue. Sometimes the one of the common ones you'll get is somebody calling in and says, every time I'm talking, my cursor is jumping all over the place. It's jumping to different windows, different documents. You know, no matter what I do, whenever I'm trying to type an email or something like that, my cursor is jumping all over the place. This actually comes from poor typing technique where they're resting their hands on the laptop. And in so they're putting their hands on the touchpad and that's touching different parts of the touchpad, causing the mouse to jump to different locations. So if the person, if this is really frustrating the person and they don't use the touchpad a lot, disable the touchpad. They can continue typing with poor technique and everything will be wonderful. Otherwise, they, you know, they may have to learn to type 
properly and get their hands off of there, but you got to be careful in how you present this to a customer. Um, but that's usually where that comes from is them resting their hands on the touchpad, causing the cursor to jump all over the place. So, all right, any other questions, comments, concerns? Again, that would fall under the ID10T error category. So next, no power. As the devices are mobile currently, as we have not figured out other ways of powering it, we do re rely on batteries um, to keep our devices running. And more often than not, we need to utilize an AC power plug to charge said devices. Uh, between uses or when we are going through prolonged use of the device. Currently, one of the questions you need to ask if the, if the customer is saying, is there no power? Is it running on, is it device plugged in or is it running on battery power? And unfortunately, there's a very, very strong reason IT will typically ask, is it plugged in? I can tell you, I have worked with somebody, great guy, enjoyed working with him, but at least three separate occasions, he would he would sit there and get all bent out of shape and complain about something not working. I'd walk over and it's literally not plugged in and you just plug it in and you're good to go. And then I would politely remind him, he's the reason why we all have to deal with IT asking us, is it plugged in? So cords have two sides. Always make sure to check that. Uh, yes, yeah, Cynthia, I will drop great Great tip. I have two free typing apps that I will drop in Slack uh, that can help you increase your typing speed and accuracy. All right. So first check if there's power coming from the wall outlet, simple thing. Many people don't think about it. Sometimes outlets go bad. Sometimes, you know, fuses pop. The outlet may not be functioning. Try the outlet next to it and see if that is working because that may be the simple thing. So try the simple solutions for us. First, if you go to that another, the other outlet, powers your device on right away, it means that outlet's bad. So then you can let maintenance know, hey, we got a problem here. Either there's either we got a, a circuit blown our fuse blown or we got, you know, a bad outlet that needs to be replaced. Next, check the power adapter lights. So the power adapter itself, many of them have lights, especially laptop chargers. Uh, Apples do not typically, but uh, like I know Dell, Toshiba, and a lot of them will have like a little green light on there that'll indicate that power is getting to the actual um, power supply so that you know it's actually functioning. And I think some of them even have like a little, a little LED, like a little light up ring around the connector that connects to the computer lets you know the power's coming through that. It's a quick check. Um, if there's no lights on the adapter, it itself may be faulty, try a different adapter. If you have like a few of them lying around, we had drawers full at my previous office. So like if one adapter wasn't working, we would quickly just swap it out with another one just to make sure, because um, that could be a quick fix. You'll hear us say it often, it is shocking how often it is just a bad cable. It's usually something simple. So check the simple things first. Um, make sure it's firmly connected in the wall. Don't just do a visual check, go over, touch it physically, push it to the wall. Make sure that it is securely plugged in, not just kind of loosely hanging out there. Cleaning crews, you know, they got a lot to do. So when they're coming through with the vacuum cleaners or they're moving trash cans and things like that, they can bump cables, bump connectors, and it can slightly pull these things out. You know, it's obviously not intentional. They got jobs to do, but that can dislodge things and cause things to not function properly. So that, you know, it's not getting a consistent power supply. So it doesn't work. You go up, you firmly press it in place. Voila, problem solved. You're the hero for the day. <clears throat> All right. Well, I mean, there are some that may do it intentionally. It's, you know, but just the majority, it's not. 
That's all I'm saying. All right. <coughs> so before replacing the, the adapter, try plugging into another outlet, all that kind of fun stuff. Questions so far? So quick story, when I was in college and I was taking business law, first exam we took, I remember on the exam, the professor, the extra credit question, which was an additional 10% bonus on the exam, which was huge. The bonus question on it was, name the lady who comes in after our class and cleans this room. Very few people got it. But the next day explained every single person that works at that organization is important. It's important to know their names. It's important to know what's important, you know, what they value and things like that. Every single person is integral to an, an organization functioning. Know their names, you know, be personable with them. So I never forgot that lesson. And trust me, if you are nice to people, they will be nice to you. If they see you care and you actually appreciate them, they will appreciate you. They will go above and beyond for you too. So it is a symbiotic reciprocal relationship. So just something to keep in mind. All right, next. The number lock keys. So on laptops, they don't have the real estate off times to have that fun little 10 key uh, number pad. They use the number pad across the top. Some old school people love that nice little 10, 10 key and uh, they grew up on it. They use it. It allows them for inputting databasing and stuff like that way faster than you would think is possible. So you can lock the function key on so that you can utilize it but sometimes people will forget or they will do it by accident and not know how to turn it off. So you have your function keys, you have your alt keys and your number locks. Check that these, they should have indicator lights saying that they're on. If you're talking to somebody over the phone, have them check these things real quick just to be sure that they're turned off. Um, Cause if they're saying like, as I'm typing, I'm getting different things showing up. I'm getting numbers. Sometimes I'm getting symbols. Sometimes it makes no sense. Um, why when I press, J, I'm getting uh, you know, a seven or something like that. So we check these keys, make sure that they are turned off so that we can go back to a normal QWERTY keyboard. All right. Questions so far? All right. No Bluetooth connectivity. I can't get my headphones to work. I can't get my speakers to work. Or my keyboard or my mouse, any of these fun things. It uses the radio waves instead of wires. We talked about this yesterday um, and last week. It utilizes technology called pairing. We have to remember the four steps of pairing. And also the ever critical third step that we don't necessarily always see. Short range communication technology. So first we want to check and make sure in the settings that Bluetooth is in fact enabled. On desktops up in the top, you'll see that little Bluetooth symbol that we showed you, a um, little runic symbol for block bar. And if it's got a line through it, it means it's disabled, you need to turn it on. And then that way it can actually start looking for devices to hook up to, and you can select which ones you wanna talk. Then you have um, on your phones, it's in your settings, little toggle switch on the apples. Um, Android, uh, I believe it is under settings as well. Enable it so that it can work. On laptops, there is a toggle button with the function key, the FN key to turn on and off Bluetooth. Make sure that that is toggled on just to double verify. <clears throat> And if this doesn't work, then you likely have a bad antenna 
or, or the device you're trying to hook up doesn't work. So try another device too. So if don't just think because my headphones can't hook up, my Bluetooth is shot, try a keyboard, try a speaker, something else, make sure it's not the device itself that has gone bad or the antenna has gone bad. All right. Here we go. Boom. Touch screen issues. Oh man, who can tell me the two types of touch screens there are out there? Hunter. Uh, capacitive and uh, is it resistive? It Just, is. Yeah. Good job. Capacitive good. and resistive. Great job. So these tend to have some issues along the way, more so the resistive than the capacitive. Um, tablets, smartphones, handhelds, most often today, instead of a keyboard, utilize touch flow and motion technology. Touch flow designed by HTC. Uh, technology allows a finger to drag up and down, left and right on the screen to kind of move around. Uh, Multi-touch uh, technology represents or recognizes multiple touches at the same time. Simultaneously in the screen allows you for resizing the screen, like pinch to zoom, you know, like to zoom in or zoom out, things like that. On the, the Max, they allow for the three finger swipe across the touchpad um, to go to the, the um, mission control, select what you want, and then you can come back. You can do two fingers on your uh, touchpad up and down for scrolling, all that kind of fun stuff. So it allows for greater functionality with uh, the touchscreens and touchpads themselves. So if they start to become non-responsive, first try to restart the device. That will generally reset, recalibrate, do all that kind of fun stuff. And it should clear 90% the issue is 90% of the time. Also, check for screen cracks. I know my wife is not the only one who's clumsy with phones. Some other people are as well. And sometimes you can get that hairline crack in there and you don't even realize it. And that will disrupt its ability to read um, some of the touches on the screens. <clears throat> So you check for these hairline cracks. Also, make sure the device has not gotten wet. Now, I know they say a lot of the devices are water resistant. Does not mean it can go scuba diving. It may only be water resistant up to like a couple inches, and it may not, that may ne not necessarily mean with salt water, because that's a whole different animal. So make sure, that, you know, even so, try to protect the device, make sure it does not get wet. All right, some devices have built-in diagnostic tools that can be tried if possible to say, touch this part of the screen, touch that part of the screen, drag your finger here, draw a circle, you know, and it helps recalibrate the touch screen itself. Yes, DW. Uh, on the, the water resistant, uh, I had one of the first like uh, mobile devices to be water resistant. It was like a HCC one or something like that. And I was go I was golfing, and we had you know when you when you golf you take a cooler and you have beer or drinks or whatever. And I, I was like, yo, it's water resistant, and I threw it in the cooler. Three hours later, I came and turned my phone off. It was a break. It was, it, it, it was it's water not just resistant. water. It's not just water. It's the ice too. <laughs> yes, it was a combination. So when I called them, I was like, yeah. hey, you guys told me it was water resistant. They're like, well, you had it in freezing water, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> one, of, yeah. one of the many devices that didn't survive Darwin Gomers. Yeah, I'm there with you, man. I've, I've killed uh, a multitude of devices in my days and, and cars too. I think, I, I think I held a record of two cars in less than 36 hours, uh, which was quite impressive. Um, in my defense, uh, the oil light wasn't working. It never came on. <laughs> so uh, it happens. Um, but I also was not a mechanic. My brother said I should have recognized it, but I was like, you're the mechanic, not me. I, I don't know how to do this stuff. Um, but, you know, live and learn. So onward. 
apps not loading. So many of these can be purchased uh, directly through the Apple Store or Google Play. Um, Google is a little more friendly to third-party apps. Apple has a more of a reputation of cracking down on the third-party applications. They do not like them. Um, so like it's either through their store or nothing, and they tend to uh, push out in their updates ways to shut down these third-party applications. One of the problems could be uh, was a fail to download. When you downloaded the app originally, it did not uh, fully downloading it, causing an error, uh, which means the app may just need to be deleted and reinstalled. Um, so check it just to make sure it actually completed installation and download. If not, again, delete, reinstall it. If the app is downloaded, but will not install or load, try restarting the device because then that may clear up some of the issues. Um, there might be so, like some other applications may be hung up. This may break that and allow it to uh, reconnect. If it still won't deploy, uninstall it again, reinstall it again. Uh, too much data is usage. Another issue, apps in some use too much data as they run in the background and they could slow devices down, which is why we say on the regular, check your phone, make sure what applications are running and just start closing stuff out. If you haven't used it in the last hour or two, shut it down. You don't need it running in the background, chewing up your, your memory or your data usage for the month. You know, if you're only allowed so much data, go in and turn off the automatic background refresh on a lot of these applications so that it will only refresh when you tell it to. So when you open it, then it refreshes. It cannot refresh in the background. You can turn that off, save your data. All right. Or you can set them to restrict usage to when they are only on Wi-Fi. Many of them now will allow for like, like handoffs. Like if you're running on cellular, like if you're talking on the phone, when you get home and you're on your cellular, when it hits your home network, it'll switch over to Wi-Fi calling rather than using your cellular minutes. So it's nice how they're, you know, evolving this technology. Sometimes it doesn't work so good. Sometimes it results in a dropped call. Like every time I come home, my phone drops, you know, because like it's trying to switch networks and just drops that call. So sometimes it's not as clean as we would like, but it is evolving over time. All right, slow performance. When performance slows over time as the device has been on, it could be due to applications running in the background, all of which are using up a little bit of that RAM. So different ways we could go, shutting down the applications when they are not in use or deleting applications that we no longer use, free up that space. <clears throat> I know it's hard to give up on something because you paid 99 cents for it. And you know it was the best app ever for three weeks, but that was six years ago and you haven't used it. You know, Don't be a digital pack rat, let it go. I mean, they don't, they don't have digital hoarders. You know, like, like they have the, the hoarder show, they have, you know, where people come in and they support them and help them, you know, get rid of all the stuff in their house. They don't have that for people who store applications that way, you know, but we're getting to that point where people will have like 5,000 applications on their phone. They don't use half of them and they just can't bear to get rid of them because they actually invested in this application. They spent the 99 cents. So. Delete the app if you're not using it. Shut it down if, you, if it's not in use. Do that pretty regular a couple times a day. It'll keep your phone running pretty smooth. Other solutions with regards to laptops and mobile devices, check for viruses, okay? They do have antivirus and anti-malware for cell phones, for mobile devices. It's worth having, although, you know, I love... You know, we all like to believe in the best of humanity and you shouldn't have to have an antivirus for your phone. But unfortunately, that is not the way the world works. We do need them. Um, so some of us may be in between antiviruses at the moment. So we may need to start looking and doing research, start investing. 
And then uh, make sure you don't have viruses or malware on your phone or on your laptop because that could be slowing things down too. It's one of the key symptoms for a virus. Uh, next would be um, if you have mechanical drives, defragmenting your hard drive so that all contiguous programs are grouped together and uh, the program can read and write to them much faster. But again, we will talk about this as well a little bit later. And then check the system for possibly upgrading the RAM or hard drive, not necessarily an option with cell phones because all that stuff is soldered in, but on laptops, you can upgrade the RAM and hard drives pretty readily. Yes, Stephen. Yeah, uh, what is defragging again? Defragging is defragmenting. Uh, we will get that. So like when you write to a drive, it writes everything together the first time. Then say you delete something and then it's going to rewrite again. It's going to write in those gaps of the storage. So, you know, all those gaps may not be together. So it may write a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. So it's kind of the file itself is broken up into smaller parts and saved across the drive. Now, when you're trying to, re you know, read from that, it's having to skip all over that platter looking for that data. So it's taking longer time to actually put these programs together or this data together so you can actually use it. And so the file is what is called fragmented. So when you defragment it, it will rewrite these things so that they're all clumped together as they should be. When we start talking about file structures uh, with regards to NTFS and FAT32, FAT64 and stuff like that, we will show you kind of how the file structure is built and then, you know, that'll make a little more sense as to what defragmenting itself does. Okay, Kelly, uh, Jerusalem had uh, a question in the chat. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, she wants to know why the software update is not listed as, I guess, a factor for slow performance. Uh, um, not causing this yeah. issue. I guess because they weren't wanting to address the planned obsolescence thing. Um, <laughs> because it was still considered kind of a conspiracy theory at the time where no, no companies would never do anything like that. You know, so that, that quite hasn't made it. And uh, there actually have been several lawsuits out there with regards to it. So it is still an alleged thing. It's not a guaranteed thing, but yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Like you do an update and all of a sudden everything slows down. So especially with regards to laptops and desktops, you always do a um, set a restore point before you do an update like that. That way, if something goes bad, you just back out of it and then you don't have to deal with it anymore. You wait until they can fix that problem. Um, with regards, uh, DW, that was a great question. Defragmenting, you cannot defragment on an SSD. You can actually damage the drive if you try to defragment an SSD. SSD operates in a very different manner in the way it you store and retract, you know, retrieve information from it is much faster. It actually operates on a molecular level. <clears throat> so the defragmenting process doesn't actually serve a purpose there. And like I said, can can actually physically like damage the drive to where it's not functional anymore. So please don't try to defrag a SSD, only mechanical drives. Yeah, SSD. Yeah, I was about to say I put something up. Yeah, SSD is a different type of technology. Like, think about like you know how you use guys use a flash drive. It has the same technology for a solid state drive. So let's say if you remove files from your drive, right? Um, depending, it actually can happen. But all you got to do there's a little icon where you could just like. Uh, refile it, meaning there's like names, kinds, the way you want to order it. So you just press that little icon, it's on the like GUI and it'll put your files back together. So it's not, it's not defragmenting like the platter, but it's kind of sort of, a, I don't want to use the same word for the platter in the SSD, more, but more it's of a, a way cleanup. to organize. It's a way yeah. to put your files back together. Yeah, a cleanup. A cleanup, right? Yeah. Yeah, laptops do mostly use SSDs at this point. All right. <clears throat> so upgrading the RAM and the hard drive is where our next update your system. There it is right there. Updating the system in this case is supposed to help cure slow performance. So they're, 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 they're pushing against the, uh, 
the the allegedness that they would uh do something nefarious like that we have no comment um next you can use your ms config uh, to disable programs that are starting when the device powers on so a lot of times when we install applications on our desktops on our devices all that stuff they want to make things extremely convenient for you so as soon as you turn your computer on when you installed it they automatically went ahead and put that in your startup operations so as soon as you fire up your computer all this stuff has to turn on you know almost anything you install dropbox your uh, vpns um social media all that fun stuff because they want you to have easy access so all that stuff starts firing up the moment you turn your computer on slows that process down makes things take significantly longer to get brought up so you go into ms config turn off everything you don't want to start up when you start up your computer things will go a lot faster more so a problem with windows machines than macs but even with macs you want to pay attention to it <clears throat> solutions for smartphones stop your background applications be sure to update your programs on the regular um, and then turn off background service that's always run including google services maps google drive things like that questions comments complaints revelations yes karen so when you um turn off things like the google maps and stuff like that you can you it doesn't mess mess anything up like on your no. phone no okay because you you could they actually have like they typically have three settings like off on or only on when in use okay so you can set it to only be on when in use so like when you open google maps then it it, it clicks on this the uh location services and starts tracking and my other question is, so when I just tap out of a, close out of a, a app, that's not cutting it off? That's not no, turning it off? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's still running in the background. Because oh, they wow. want to be sure that if you jump right back in, they still have your stuff saved for you just to make it easy. So okay. they still, they'll run in the background for a particular amount of time. Some of them are longer than others. Some will never turn off unless you turn them off. So um you got to go in there and you you know it's usually like you pull up the it's different for apple and for android for apple you drag your finger from the bottom left up to the center the pages yeah and then it'll show all the open applications and then you take e each application you want to close and you just swipe it up uh somebody who has an android can you tell us how you do it on an android please <laughs> don't be shy No Android users. This is all like Apple users. Yeah, all about is Apple. <laughs> this is amazing. Is that right? We're all Apple users up in here. There we go. Julian, in search and settings and type to disable. Yeah, but you don't want to look up every single app. There's a there's a way you can you can pull up all the apps and start disabling the apps as you think. The window button and then swipe them up. There you go. Thank you, DW. So press that window button and then swipe up, and that should help you close out open applications uh just out yes yeah, so my question to what's the difference between uh onedrive and google drive onedrive is owned by microsoft and google drive is owned by google that's essentially the that is essentially the difference um so if you you know for onedrive you need to have a, a microsoft email like an outlook email to have access to onedrive for Google Drive, you need to have a Gmail account to, and then you get uh, access to 15 gigs of Google Drive for free. And then you can share drives with other people too. So like if you want to share files, if you want to share like access to a drive, like um, many of the uh, instructors here, we created like me, Marvin and two other TAs and uh, master instructor Diego created a compendium of all the stuff for the ITSS program. And then we stored it all in a in a Google Drive. And then anytime we get a new instructor that wants access, we grant them access to it. So they have all the information they could possibly need. So. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Rachel. 
a comment and a question. Um, when we were talking about defrag, it reminds me of a scattered Rubik's cube that you okay. put back together. So all like pieces are on one side mm -hmm. of each. That's just an illustration that I use for myself. And you mentioned um, malware and antivirus where, uh, software. Do you have any suggestions for purchased and free? I'm always leery of free anti-malware, antivirus. Because okay. a lot of times that is a nefarious actor basically trying to get access to your system. So be very, very cautious with free when it comes to like antivirus and anti-malware. Um, there are a few, what is it, Kaspersky is one that does a phone one. Um, Norton has uh, a phone one. Um, there are quite a few out there. Uh, there's some, some being dropped in. Is that a antivirus total AV, Cynthia? Yeah, it um it does for your desktop and also for your mobile and other devices. So depending on okay. the time you get, like you can add on features and whatever specific thing, whatever your specific network is, you pick that plan or add features or decrease features, and that'll add the protection and give you like clean your disk, your hard drive, um, junk files, duplicates. Um, it'll clean that up for you really quickly. Also, it'll clean up your browser files or anything that needs to be cleaned up on the um, internet when it comes okay. to like cache and logs. And yeah, it has a, a, an array of different features. So it just depends on like your purpose, you know? And you are the second person I've heard use it pronounced cache. Um, so excellent. It's I don't even know how to, I, know. I'm like, I don't even know how to say it. Cash, I say cache, right? But yeah, cash, you're the second, cache. it's cash. You're the second person I've heard yeah. pronounce it as cache. It sounds so, it sounds so formal. Um, <laughs> I always so, say case. Cache. <laughs> yeah. Um, then uh, somebody was equating that a VPN is not the same thing as antivirus. They are not the same thing. And a VPN does not protect you from viruses or malware. You can be hacked. You can still be hacked if you yes. use a VPN. Like, yes. It just gives you added protection <clears throat> if you're in on insecure connection. Like if you're using, if you go like to Panera or Starbucks or a public library and you're using their Wi-Fi, you want to have the VPN, the virtual private connection gives you an added layer of protection with an insecure Wi-Fi connection. So it's like you're a tube in this craziness of chaos and you're kind of sort of being protected. Um, yeah, it protects data in transit. That's it. So like when, when data is going in between point A and point B, which tends to be the most vulnerable point for data, it's protecting it in there. So it protects people from being able to look at it, but, 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 but you can still contract viruses. You can still be hacked, all that kind of fun stuff. So the, please don't equate those two things. Um, but we will talk about security measures and the various things like that in 1002. So we will be getting to that, I do promise you. Um, also, yes, Norton makes a pretty good, they have one called Norton 360, which will give you a VPN, antivirus, anti-malware. It works for multiple devices. So it will do antivirus on your phone, all kinds of stuff. So do your research, look at it and just, you know, make sure you look into any companies <clears throat> before you get involved with them. Also, Rachel, it looks like if you want to start a voiceover career, you have a lot of fans already in this particular class. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, any other questions before we get started? All right, next. Here we go. Freezing up. A frozen system can occur for many of the same reasons mentioned in the topic for slow performance. It could be a virus. Ugh. It could be your system overheating. It could be all kinds of things. So when your system frees up and is unresponsive, you're going to want to do a hard boot. So if it's a desktop, you're going to press or desktop or a laptop, you're going to press and hold that power button for like three to five seconds. Um, and then it's going to do a hard shutdown and then you can do a reboot. If you're on a um, Apple device, you're going to press the uh, 
was it the power down button and the home button and hold that for 30 seconds. It's going to shut everything down and then reboot it. Uh, does anybody know what it is for Android? I forgot what I like, is it hold home and volume up or volume down for like 30 seconds? And then that um, will do a hard reboot on it. And that's does a hard shutdown and then restarts from scratch. So if you get frozen up, that is the way um, you would go through that. Um, after that, you should be good 90% of the time. Um, if the device is frozen while texting, like if it's trying to upload or connect or whatever, turn on airplane mode. That'll kill all wireless communications at that point and force the then you turn it back on. It'll force the device to reestablish a connection. And it's almost like rebooting that wireless protocols and clear up a lot of those problems. Yeah, but sometimes if you press control delete, if the system is frozen to style, that won't work. So you have to press and hold the power button on your laptop or desktop for, you know, five, 10 seconds. And that'll just, it'll do a hard kill on it and then bring it back. So if you're frozen, control delete will not work. <laughs> I don't know, Leela. <laughs> It's possible, I guess, if you could stop a message from sending that way. I, I would say don't rage text. You know, that would be my suggestion. <laughs> so. Although there are some of them, like there's some applications you can install that if you try to type a text, it'll actually go, are you sure you want to send this? So you could always, you know, employ one of those if you wish. You can delete it on your phone, not on the phone of the person you sent it to, though. All right. Unable to decrypt email. All right. So sometimes you're viewing emails through a browser and a mobile device. It can be challenging because at times the mobile version of the browser cannot locate the certificate, which basically authenticates who you are uh, with the server and the key that goes along with it. So it will not be able to decrypt that particular message. They've gotten a lot better with this over the years. This was about uh, five years ago or so. Now there, there are... Um, encrypted email applications and encrypted email services that actually are quite uh, non-taxing with regards to processing power and work a lot smoother. So this, this technology has evolved incredibly over the last few years. Uh, no, 802.11 AC is not a speed, that is a protocol though. And that protocol would have to operate at particular speeds. So when we start getting to uh, wireless protocols, yes, you'll, you'll see what 802.11ac is. Questions, comments, concerns. Also remember SMIME, make sure that is enabled if you're trying to decrypt because that is the security protocol for emails. If we remember from yesterday, Avery stressed that one pretty heavily. Um, viewing the email in the intended app. So go to your Gmail application, not necessarily the mail application on your um, phone. That would be one way to do it as well. Um, sometimes you can utilize a smart card with the key that is needed to decrypt if you want to do that. So there are ways to get it uh, a little more function. Sometimes you can use what's called a token um, rather than utilizing certificates. And that token is a little bit more secure. They have hardware versions and software versions. We'll talk about that in security devices. Those are kind of cool. All right, overheating. Uh, if the vents on your phone are blocked, yes, your phone has vents. Um, that it uses to breathe and clear and uh, 
cool things down. If those become blocked by dust, debris, pocket lint, that's the big one. Um, Cause we shove these things in our pocket constantly. And so over time that stuff can start to block those vents. The phone doesn't work quite as well. So you need to clean out those little, you know, vents. They typically are right around the speakers, cleaning that stuff out regularly so that your phone can breathe and cool itself pretty easily. Yes, Jessica. Do you recall that time, because um, you're in Florida, <laughs> where I know, at least I think it's, uh, um, there were a few incidents in Florida, but when people's phones were like exploding. And oh, the, 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 the Nokia exploder phones? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What exactly was happening? What, 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 what was that defect with that? Well, um, there is a instance with the battery, like um, it was the, the batteries are separated by a plate. And if that separation isn't done properly, it's, it's, I can't remember the exact name of the, uh, the process, like if it gets, ground it out and then it starts to heat up and then it just starts continuing to go. Um, I'll look up the exact name for it and I'll explain it to you, but it's like a chemical reaction that starts happening. It's like catastrophic. Um, I'll look it up and I'll, I'll get you the exact name for it. Okay. But it's essentially a, a chemical reaction starts. Once that reaction starts, it can't stop. The battery heats up, swells and potentially explodes. So if the, if the batteries get bent or um, dislodged or jostled, um, if they weren't built properly, it can create that chain reaction to happen. So I'll find the, the correct name for it because I don't want to lie. And I will, get, I will let you know about it. So, but yeah, and it wasn't just in Florida. It was kind of all over the place. So, but yeah, I do remember that as well. Um, so. If you constantly have your phone hooked up to a charger, this is not a good thing. Um, that can cause the phone to overheat and also can cause problems with the battery, like the swelling, things like that, and eventually could cause a catastrophic failure, um, like Jessica was just talking about. But more often than not, it is a swollen or dead battery uh, that will, you know, if you leave it plugged in, if you keep it in a hot surface. Like if you live in Florida, don't leave your phone in your car. Phones are like people, they don't like the heat. You know, if you can, if you can bake a sheet of cookies on your, uh, on your dashboard, it is not gonna be good for electronic devices or people. So take your phones with you. Come back and check on the cookies later. Um, so keep things cool that, you know, electronic equipment likes computers like we do, or they like temperatures like we do. They generally are comfortable in that 65 to 80 range. That's, that's that, you know, sweet spot where, you know, electronic devices like to be in. If we get much below that or much above that, it starts to cause problems with the devices themselves. Um, again, laptops. We talked about this when we were talking about laptops. Don't put them on pillows. Don't put them on towels. Don't actually have them sitting on your lap. I know the name is misleading. We don't want to do that. We use TV trays, hard, flat surfaces. Uh, if you're going to put them on a table, make sure they're not on a placemat or on a, on a tablecloth. You know, Move those out of the way. Set the laptop on that flat surface so that the vents underneath it can breathe properly. Um, again, those vents can become clogged with dust and debris over time. They do have specialized vacuums. You can use compressed air to blow that stuff out of there. And when you're in a charging cycle, especially with cell phones and things like that, cell phones and tablets re reduce, if not eliminate its use while it's in a charging cycle. Because if you're charging it while you're using it, that's increasing that heat. It's increasing that, uh, you know, the processor being used. It's using more energy it can damage the device. You'll heat up faster or things like that. If you ever notice, like if you're driving in your car, listening to it on your phone and you have it plugged in, especially in summertime, you look down eventually and you see that sad little thermometer on there that your phone is not working right now. Come, please try again later. All right. Make sure your air vents are clean or clear.
No sound from speakers. First, do the boomer check. Make sure the volume's up. It's not on silent. Uh, check that first. Make sure sound is enabled. Sometimes it's not. Also, uh, restart the device. If, if you've tried those things, restart the device, see if that works. Check the sound on that particular app. As you may have noticed in Zoom, it doesn't matter what the volume is on your particular computer. You can turn it up, you can turn it down. It's not affecting the volume you're getting out of Zoom. You actually have to go into the Zoom application itself and turn the volume up there. So sometimes it's individual applications have their own volume settings that you have to um, adjust to get the proper volume. Me personally, I like this because some, some applications are extremely loud and hurt my ears. Some are extremely soft and I can't hear what the heck they're saying. So I like being able to tweak individual applications without having to adjust all the volume on my entire device. All right. Next, you can check and see if there are any updates for your integrated sound card. There are aftermarket sound cards you can add if you're big into gaming and stuff like that. 3D sound cards are really cool um, with regards to um, playing immersive games and things like that. Next, after that, if all else fails, attempt a system reset. You can then apply the King method to try to get your system up and running. All right. Good on time. GPS not functioning. So if the location services does not appear to be working, even after you restart your phone, congratulations, you're off grid, you succeeded. All right, but if you actually need those services to get around and want to you know, actually utilize them, next, check and make sure the location service GPS on your system is enabled uh, before trying any further solutions. So you wanna make sure the antenna itself has turned on and allows it to be utilized. Next, check to ensure the device has either cellular or Wi-Fi connection, because remember we were talking about sometimes you can't get the line of sight on at least three satellites, so you can use cellular enabled GPS, which can uh, augment it to help give a better representation of where you are. All right, next, be sure the user is not covering the antenna, since this could affect performance. I don't know many people who walk around and like have their hand over the top of their phone when they're talking, but you know, I wouldn't put it past humanity um, for somebody to feel that, you know, that that is comfortable in the way, you know, they want to talk. It could be they're just kind of laying on their side. I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, but if you cover the antennas, they don't work quite as well. Uh, yes, you know, we are better, you know, doorways than windows. We can block signals or at least absorb part of those signals. If you don't believe me, look up a lot of the conspiracy theories around 5G. I'm kidding. Don't do that. All right. Next. If you have windshields with UV protection on them, this also can block or disrupt signals from satellites. Some of the uh, tinting um, that people utilize that can... Uh, affects your signals due to, you know, absorption or, or refraction or reflection. So I'm not going to advise you to drive down the road with your hand out the window with your phone. That usually leads to sadness because, you know, we lose grip of our phone or something along those lines. But um, that could be part of the problem. That's funny, Karen. <laughs> All right. Next, swollen battery. This one is just a big old frowny face. All right, always use the appropriate power charger. I know sometimes it's tempting where you don't have a charger with you and you look in the gas station, they have that cheap $2 cable, leave it there. It is not gonna be good for your devices. They can damage your devices. Not all power cables are created equally. If it is a dollar or 50 cent cable, 
there's probably a reason for that. It may mean that it's pushing, to, you know, it's not restricting the flow as well. It could be pushing too much to the battery, overloading it, causing it to um, swell up. Once a battery swells up, it's done. There is no recovery from that. Um, so make sure you're using the appropriate chargers. That doesn't mean you have to buy the brand name charger for the device you have, you know? You don't have to buy a gold plated one. But again, buy it from a reputable company, not, not the gas and sip. You know, we want to find a good cable to charge our phones with. All right, don't leave the device plugged in all the time. One, this will kill your runtime, your ability to, uh, your battery life, because batteries actually have a memory to a degree. So if we only use the battery for 30 minutes and then we plug it back in just to top it off, then over time, the battery will only have that 30 minute uh, life cycle. You can exercise a battery by fully charging it, fully depleting it, fully charging it, fully depleting it, and it can extend that. But that is more typical with NICADs than with the lithium ions. But don't leave them plugged in all the time because that can destroy the batteries as well. All right. I'm trying to see if it actually has that term I was looking for in here. All right. Keep batteries, devices stored in a cool, dry environment. Occasional use in the sun is okay. Do not store them in a hot car, especially like we said in Florida, where it can be 150 degrees with 200% humidity and there is just no safe place. All right. Batteries experiencing short life or not holding a charge. Uh, if you keep your brightness on your phone too high or you don't set it to where the screen turns off after about 30 seconds or a minute or two when not in use, this can be a heavy drain on the battery. The screen is the biggest drain on your battery in your phone. Um, let's see here. Constantly enabled wireless connections or location services. Uh, constantly enabled background data services, all the stuff chews up battery life as well. Um, if you, again, if you don't, if you're not using Bluetooth devices at the time, please turn off your Bluetooth. One, it saves power because it's not going to be looking for Bluetooth devices that it might be associated with. If you're not using Wi-Fi, turn the Wi-Fi off, you know, because then it's not going to be searching for a Wi-Fi signal to connect to. Um, so if things are not in use, these are ways you can actually extend your battery life a lot further. Because if it's searching for a signal, that search for the signal takes more battery power, takes more energy, uses those batteries up faster. These are ways you can um, get more life out of your battery. You can turn airplane mode off, on and then that turns off all your wireless stuff. You won't have cell signal. But, you know, if you, if you want to jam out the tunes just to get through that particular meeting and then you're going to get to your car where you have your charger, great. That'll get you through there. It'll allow you to turn off all those wireless signals so you don't, you're not using the extra power, give you some extra battery life. All right. Yes, Stephen. So what if, what if the device is like in a really cold area? Is that bad too? Yes, extreme temperatures are, are bad for electronic devices in both ways. So um, extreme cold temperatures can kill batteries too. It won't cause the, was it, it's like, I think, okay. I think the term is catastrophic overload where it's, it, um, the batteries go, the chain reaction starts and it can't be stopped. And that's when the batteries kind of blow up. Um, that doesn't happen in the cold weather but it can kill the batteries. Like, you know, like if you live up North in New York and, you know, Maine and all that kind of fun stuff, you actually have to buy batteries that are made uh, to withstand those kind of temperatures. Like Die Hard was one of the big ones for the longest time. It's like, you know, if it gets really cold, your battery won't die. You know, they, they had those advertisements forever. So um, 
you have to make special accommodations for extreme temperatures like that. Um, so again, the range somewhere between like the 60s to the 80s, that's where they, they like to stay. If they get above that, they start to have problems. If they get below that, they start to have problems. Doesn't mean every single time it kills it, it just, <laughs> the likelihood gets much higher. I went swimming with my phone one time and it was completely okay. Okay, great. Don't do it twice. <laughs> all right any other questions how much is the new battery that completely depends on your device uh the make and model and manufacturer for a while there apple basically wanted you to pay as much as you would for a new phone to get a new battery but lawsuits told them nope you cannot do that that needs to be an inexpensive repair the right to repair i think that went all the way up to the supreme court um so sometimes they can be as low as like 10 15 dollars for a mobile device sometimes they can be as much as like a hundred dollars or so it depends on the make and model and the the uh uh manufacturer all right The law made it, the law passed to make it more accessible. So you couldn't overcharge for something like that. At a certain point, when you start hitting percentages over manufacturing, it actually, it falls into price gouging or predatory pricing. So there actually are specific laws that govern these things predating these laws. All right. So these are the six steps for troubleshooting. We will get into this next week. Good to take a screenshot of this and just kind of have it in the back of your mind because we're going to go into these in a lot more detail. So your, your first step of troubleshooting any situation, this works for almost any problem you have with regards to IT. First, you want to identify the problem. So you want to identify the root cause, not the symptoms. So this is done through you know, either seeing the errors themselves, interviewing the client, things like that. So we want to identify the problem. And then after we've identified what the problem is, establish a theory on how we're going to fix it. Next, we're going to test that theory to make sure that it is solving the issue that we are trying to address. Now, if this is something like a server or something like that, you're not going to be playing around with a server that is live and just guessing to see if it works. No, you're going to create a sandbox environment, try to duplicate that problem and see if you can correct it on something else before you implement it into something that is already in action. So you test your theory, make sure that that, you know, the problem you think it is, is exactly what it is. After that, you plan the fix and resolve the problem. So you implement what you have planned to do. Last two components or, pe or steps people tend to forget. First, verify that you actually solved the problem. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the phone with, with IT and they don't do this. And I have to remind them, you know, like, aren't you going to verify functionality? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they'll come in and they'll check it. So verify that you have actually fixed the problem. And then lastly, document it. Tell, you know, what steps did you take? What worked? What didn't work? Because both of those are very valuable pieces of information because this problem may come up three years from now instead of tomorrow again on another computer. And then you'd be like, oh man, what did I do to fix that? But if you have documentation, you can go back and check that documentation. Oh, okay, yeah, I did this, this, and this. Great, wonderful. So always remember documentation. So again, we will have a whole technical session just on troubleshooting where we will go over these steps, but these six steps, you absolutely need to know. It comes up on 10.01 and 10.02. Very heavy on the 10.02. Yeah. They, they ask that you have to know different situations, you know, very heavy. Well, you can do personal documentation, Stephen, but a lot of times the organizations you work with will have internal 
documentation systems that you will utilize. Get to that next week. Yep. All right. With that, we are done. We now should be able to identify common issues that users experience with mobile devices and describe how to likely resolve those common issues. Comments, questions, complaints, concerns. <laughs>